uh, to another instance of the uh, remote condensed matter seminar. So today uh, we welcome Dr. Miguel Moreno Ugedpa, who is a principal investigator at the uh, Donostia International Physics Center in San Sebastian in Spain. Uh, Miguel obtained his PhD in 2011 at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, uh, also in Spain, where he worked on electronic and magnetic properties of graphene. So he then joined the physics department at UC Berkeley uh, to work as a postdoc under Mike Romy, uh, and then he continued his SDM work, and Miguel has since been a guest researcher at several prominent research institutions worldwide, uh, including Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research, uh, Osaka University, Freie University in Berlin, and Aarhus University. Uh, in 2015, he then moved back uh, to Spain and worked as an ICABASC fellow on low dimensional superconductivity. And then he was awarded a, uh, an ECR starting grant in 2017. Uh, so this is related to his, his topic today. He will be talking about unconventional superconductivity in two dimensional uh, Fender Bartz materials. Uh, yeah, thanks, Miguel. Yeah, Good having you. So feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thanks for me. Okay, so um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, so first of, first of all, let me let me thank Ben for his kind invitation to participate in your um, seminar series and for being able to uh, share with you our latest some of our our latest results. So today, as you can see in the title, I would like to discuss about the emergence of unconventional superconductivity. In, in two dimensional materials. And in particular, I will focus on transition metal like aquagenetics. Uh, but before doing so, uh, let me first, um, oh, yeah, let me first um, give you some, some words about where we are. So we are located here in San Sebastian, a very small uh, city next to the, the border with France here in the north. So San Sebastián, for those of you who are not familiar with, San Sebastián is a beautiful city, small city by the coast, as you can see here in this picture. And despite its size, San Sebastián has a, um, a huge uh, scientific tradition and for historical reasons that I'm not going to get into. But uh, that's the reason why there are a certain uh, number of uh, uh, scientific, scientific institutions in the city. Two of them are the Donostia International Physics Center and the Material Physics Center, uh, the institutions that uh, where we belong. Actually, we are located in, in this particular building, Material Physics Center. Okay, uh, let me also uh, start acknowledging the people who uh, are participating in, in this project on superconductivity and to the materials. First of all, let me uh, thank my coworkers here in the 2DSPM group at the DAPC, Wen Wang, who is a postdoc, and Paul Dreher uh, is a PhD student. So these two guys have done most of the work that I will present today. <clears throat> Rishabh Harsh, Harsh is a, a postdoc that joined the group one year ago. So he's, he's been contributing as well to this project. Uh, we have come with a, a theoretical support by Francisco Guinea and Felix Indurain. Uh, so these two guys from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid are uh, providing us with uh, insulating substrates so that we can grow our 2D superconductors and insulate them from, from the rest of the, of, of the substrate. The people from the uh, Oros uh, University led by Jill Miwa and Philip Hoffman are uh, you know, taking care or, or are carrying out beautiful ARPES uh, measurements and uh, Oh, uh, Miguel, somehow you got muted again. Yeah, okay, back. So our neighbors of uh, CIC Nanogune uh, are also working on uh, devices and also synchrotron measurements on, on these material, materials. Um, what do I have to do? Okay, so as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, today I'd like to focus on something called unconventional superconductivity. Ben asked me to be a bit, um, or explain in more detail because I don't think you are uh, mostly focused on superconductivity or most of you are not. So I would like to give up an introduction about what we mean by uh, unconventional superconductivity. So I guess most of you, however, are familiar with uh, phonon mediated Cooper pair uh, formation mechanisms, which is depicted somehow here. So an electron crosses uh, a particular region in, in the space around the lattice 
and due to the um, um, to the giving of a, of a phonon, this region gets distorted elastically and uh, becomes positively charged, which is which becomes a, a region for of attraction for a second electron. This, this second electron takes back uh, a phonon, the momentum that the first electron uh, left there. And basically, this is the way the, the Cooper pair is created. So in this phonon mediated uh, uh, Cooper pair formation, the phonon acts as a glue or, or pairing glue in, in the superconductivity. However, uh, this is not the only way that Cooper pairs can be for formed. And actually, um, you know, despite of the uh, Coulomb repulsion between electrons, the effective electron in electron electron interaction can become very uh, can become um, attractive in space and and, and time regions uh, through uh, the spin spin and spin interaction and charge charge interaction. In particular, since we are dealing with a many body problem, uh, we should talk about uh, the spin susceptibility, the non-local spin susceptibility, and the charge density as a pairing glue in this case. <clears throat> so in this particular um, way of pairing, uh, the spin susceptibility plays a large role. And I will show you in a second, magnetism, it's a distinctive hallmark of unconventional superconductivity in general. So uh, the phonon mediated uh, um, Cooper performation is well described by the BCS uh, pairing, the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer pairing, and the the wave function of the Cooper pair is in general uh, isotropic, uh, constant in the space. In the case of uh, unconventional superconductivity, which is referred to everything else that it's not phonon mediated. Uh, the symmetry of the system is lower, the Cooper pair uh, wave function is lower, and therefore this leads to uh, more anisotropic uh, um, um, order parameters, right? In this case, the, 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 the spin of the per Cooper pair has to be in general a singlet, whereas here it can be either a singlet or a triplet component. Okay, so um, here I show you a plot where you can see the the critical temperature of uh, some superconductors and the year where they can where they were uh, discovered, as you can see, since the beginning of their superconductivity era in 1911 until almost 1980, all the superconductors that were uh, discovered were conventional superconductors. Actually, in uh, 1958, the VCS theory was developed and uh, fully explained the superconducting. Uh, properties of, of these materials. So at this point of history, basically, you know, it seemed that uh, the superconductivity problem was ba uh, basically nailed and finished. But suddenly, um, this uh, particular material, uh, this uh, heavy fermion uh, compound, was discovered uh, shortly after the ur uranium-based uh, uh, materials were discovered too as superconductors. And um, it was clear that uh, the superconducting properties of these materials were far from um, fit the B BCS theory. And actually, um, you know, shortly after this, this discovery, a large amount of uh, families of superconductors were discovered. To highlight a, a few, of course, we have the cuprates here with uh, very high uh, critical temperatures. More recently, in 2008, the uh, iron-based superconductors were discovered as well. So nowadays, actually, unconventional superconductivity is basically uh, not the exception, but the usual case. And the conventional superconductors are uh, basically the exception. So there are many different families of unconventional superconductors, but uh, with quite uh, diverse superconducting properties and Actually, there is no uh, theory that explains this behavior at um, once, no, a unified theory. However, there are certain common characteristics of these uh, unconventional superconductors. One of them is that um, in general, and only in general, there are exceptions to this one as well, uh, unconventional superconductivity is uh, sustained in general by uh, D or F uh, electron cations. And therefore, these electrons are well known to uh, lead to a strong electronic correlations in, in the material. Another common characteristic of this unconventional superconductivity is their uh, two-dimensional character. So in general, they're uh, 
atomic structure shows a uh, strong uh, anisotropy. Here I show you an example. This is a, a visco uh, superconductor, a cuprate superconductor, where you can see that the superconducting planes are basically confined in two dimensions or nearly two dimensions, few planes, few atomic planes, and isolated by other, other planes. <clears throat> However, the material in general is a three dimensional, has a three dimensional, I mean, it's bulk, it's a three dimensional uh, material. And the third common characteristics is that in general, these materials uh, uh, show superconductivity quite close to uh, magnetically ordered uh, phases. In general, they develop around what it's called uh, quantum, um, um, quantum critical points. Uh, and the reason is because at these points, the uh, fluctuations are quite high because in this point, you are close to or, or are in the vicinity of a second order uh, phase transition. So magnet, uh, uh, magnetic phases are second order phase transitions. So uh, fluctuations, quantum fluctuations are quite high here and superconductivity develops. So as an example here, I show you a couple of um, uh, phase diagrams for these uh, two um, uh, heavy fermion compounds. Here, superconductivity develops at the bottom of an antifer uh, antiferromagnetic uh, dome. And in this case, for this material, for this uh, uranium uh, based material, superconductivity instead develops uh, within the ferromagnetic uh, uh, dome. Okay, um, so these are the common characteristics of, in general, uh, unconventional superconductors. There is a long list of fingerprints that uh, we can uh, study in order to know uh, or to learn if a material of a superconductor is, um, is unconventional. I'm not going to get into uh, details here. Let me just briefly mention some that can be, in general, uh, uh, probed uh, with the SCM. For example, the existence of uh, pseudogaps, the existence, I will show you in a second, the existence of spin resonances below the critical temperature, or, for example, the uh, sensitivity of the superconducting state to non-magnetic disorder. In general, um, uh, uh, conventional superconductors are not uh, sensitive to non-magnetic disorder up to a, at least up to a certain level, but this doesn't apply uh, to unconventional superconductors. So despite all this list of this long list of um, fingerprints of un unconventional superconductivity, as I said, there is not an unified theory that um, you know gathers all below a, a model and that has not been uh, developed. It's not even known if there should be a theory that um, unifies all these materials or there should be several. So it's not clear if there is one uh, pairing glue or there's, there should be several ones. So this is still under debate. And one of the reasons why uh, we know little about unconventional superconductors, even when they were discovered 40 years ago, is, uh, in my opinion, the enormous complexity of, of this material. So um, in particular, due to a couple of things, one of them is that these materials in bulk in general show uh, really complex stoichiometries. Uh, for example, um, you can see at this uh, uh, cuprate superconductor where <clears throat> basically that uh, you can see that the unit cell is quite large, involve a lot of atoms with different elements. And actually that's uh, quite difficult, for example, to model or to grow for an experimentalist. The other reason is that these materials in general show a quite uh, complex uh, phase diagram that it's extremely dependent upon, uh, for example, doping or uh, upon the, the presence of, of defects. And that's a challenge as well for a modeling uh, but also, if you want to grow and reproduce some results, your experimentalist is quite delicate the way uh, these materials have to be grown in order to make them uh, reproducible. So that's, that's, the, that's the reason why I think this is um, so, oh, this, this field is so, so complex, so, so difficult. An alternative to, to grow, uh, uh, to, to study unconventional superconductivity uh, would be the two-dimensional superconductors, or purely, really, two-dimensional superconductors. So historically, um, uh, most of the, uh, so the two-dimensional superconductors some decades ago were basically uh, some um, amorphous films 
of uh, elements like, for example, here, bismuth or lead that, however, were mostly uh, amorphous or if, if not amorphous, uh, disorder. Okay. In the last 15 years, however, um, we have seen how uh, some crystalline materials were developed either at interfaces or on top of uh, a particular um, 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 substrate. For example, MOC2 was discovered to be superconductor if you apply a gate, so on a device. Uh, iron selenide uh, becomes um, superconducting in a single layer form, but has to be attached or grown um, to STO uh, substrate, or this is uh, an interface between the 2D materials. And then at the interface, superconductivity uh, um, uh, develops. However, in the last five years, uh, so we have been a uh, witness of the um, emergence of truly two-dimensional superconductors that they are superconductors without the need of any substrate or any uh, device attached to it. That's the case of uh, mostly, uh, for example, uh, nibon diselenide in, in the monolayer form, other TMDs, um, even monolayers of um, uh, cuprates, and the remarkable case of uh, twisted bilayer, bilayer graphene. <clears throat> However, in these last five years or so, uh, the, this 2D materials have exploded uh, and many different things and beautiful things. A lot of progress have been, has been done in regards to these two new uh, uh, novel two-dimensional superconductors. But however, the Cooper pairing glue and how the Cooper pair forms in these two materials, it's something that has been barely uh, explored so far, in particular experimentally. So <clears throat> today uh, I will focus on the case of transition metal dichalcogenide superconductors. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this family of materials, this, uh, <clears throat> these superconductors basically follow this stoichiometry with one uh, um, transition metal element here at the center, surrounded and sandwiched by two planes of calcogen atoms. Here I list to you uh, the, the elements that are uh, or the TMD materials that are superconducting in three dimensions in bulk, uh, okay? Uh, in general, these materials, even in bulk, are, or the superconductivity is coexisting in general with uh, challenging wave uh, phases. For example, the most prominent case is the niobium diselenide, where, uh, you know, has a critical temperature of 7.2 Kelvin and a challenging wave order transition of 33 Kelvin. In, in two dimensions, however, this, as I said, is a new field and basically little is known about it. We barely know that for example, niobium diselenide is superconducting below 2 Kelvin. Uh, we have just discovered that tantalum diselenide is also a superconductor above 2 Kelvin. Therefore, for example, the critical temperature increases. In other cases, decreases as niobium diselenide. We don't know why. We don't know uh, the, the reason behind all these properties in, in two dimensions. However, we know about uh, two dimensional TMD superconductors that in general satisfy all the common characteristics that unconventional superconductors uh, have, right? And in addition to that, they have uh, another property that it's quite nice, and is that uh, these materials lack of inversion symmetry in the monolayer limit. So, uh, okay, and why do I mention this? Is because it's been uh, theorized that um, any uh, two-dimensional superconductor in the presence of a strong uh, spin orbit coupling, which is the case of uh, I mean, in, in the absence of inversion symmetry, the system uh, develops a, spi a, a strong uh, spin orbit coupling because the inversion symmetry is, is, is broken and therefore uh, it's not cancelled, right? Uh, in, in that particular case, um, two dimensional superconductors um, lift the, the band structure, lift the degeneracy, the bands become spin split, and that should lead to a mixed uh, singlet and a strip and triplet state, not just a singlet. So the system should, uh, in other words, become unconventional naturally in, in two dimensions. Okay, let me go point by point uh, to show you uh, these common characteristics uh, satis are satisfied in, in TMD uh, superconductors as well. So as I said, <clears throat> in general, uh, unconventional superconductivity is sustained by D or F uh, electrons, which is what happens here. Um, in particular, uh, these are uh, D electrons uh, sustained by, for example, titanium, niobium, or tantalum. 
uh, it's well known that these uh, D electrons lead in, in, in TMD materials to a strong correlations. That's something well known already. And uh, the fingerprints of these strong correlations in 2D materials is the presence of, of uh, mod phases, charge and spin density ways of the existence of quantum spin, uh, spin liquids. That's something um, um, quite accepted in these materials already. Okay. So obviously the material is at, I mean, this family of materials are almost uh, purely two dimensional because superconductivity is basically uh, sustained along the transition metal element. The calcogen does not play a large role for superconductivity at all. So uh, basically um, in, in two dimensions, the, uh, the, um, the charge screening uh, gets reduced due to the uh, change in the, into the environment. That's what I wanted to highlight here. And therefore, uh, lower screening enhance uh, electron correlations. And that's why, in general, uh, some of the phases show up in this two-dimensional limit or are uh, even more stronger than, than in bulk, right? Um, however, what happens is that uh, most of these um, most of these um, strongly correlated uh, electronic phases usually lead to a decrease in the density of states on the firm level. And that uh, is uh, detrimental of the uh, conventional um, electron phonon uh, coupling. And, and it's detrimental of the conventional superconductivity because it reduces the uh, density of states at the firm level. Um, finally, as I said, uh, superconductivity in general is close to magnetic order in unconventional superconductors. And this is something that we haven't, uh, we don't have the experimental proof yet, uh, but there are a couple of uh, recent papers claiming so, in particular uh, for niobium disilinite. For example, this is uh, a fully uh, DFT work in which we are uh, somehow uh, involved by our colleague, uh, Felix Indurain. So he has done, uh, the, he has studied the electronic structure of niobium disilinite for bulk and for the monolayer limit. And it turns out that no matter the pseudo gap he uses, uh, the uh, most stable solution has a magnetic field. So the, the ground state of neighboring disilinite in the monolayer, monolayer limit in principle is uh, ferrimagnetic. So you can see here uh, with a, a magnetic moment of around one um, uh, Bohr magneton per, per unit cell. Following this paper, we have this, uh, this paper by Professor Massin, who, as I highlight here, demonstrate that uh, naive dysonite has to be close to a ferromagnetic instability. And actually, they claim that this magnetic instability, which is pronounced in a single monolayer, layer, can enable sizable singlet triplet mixing in the superconducting order parameter. OK, uh, so in principle, if this material, at least naive dysonite, uh, either it's magnetic or it's at the verge of being magnetic, which in principle will favor the existence of not non uh, phononic channels for, for superconductivity. Um, however, let me go back for a second to uh, non uh, phonon mediated superconductivity. So how is it possible to, uh, to that, that the superconductivity emerge without the presence of phonons? Okay, uh, so imagine that there is a you know, soap of uh, quasi particles here in a superconductor. And basically, this is the uh, affected field that this particular uh, quasi particle feels when it's surrounded by uh, other uh, quasi particles. This term basically it's proportional to the, um, to the charge density, okay, times uh, the charge of this particular electron. And there is a second term that accounts for the um, um, the magnetization that this quasi-particle feels at this particular point of in space times the spin of the electron. But if we simplified this picture and we just take into account now two uh, quasi-particles, and now we can substitute the magnetization, which can be a, a very complex, uh, um, very complex uh, amount. We can uh, substitute it by uh, the non-local um, magnetic susceptibility times the spin of this, part of this particle. And the JM is basically the strength 
of the coupling, the spin-spin coupling. Here's the, the strength of the spin-spin coupling. Okay, so basically now we can summarize the, uh, the induced potential that this uh, quasi-particle feels. Here, it's basically one, it's composed of two terms. One of them is you know, proportional to the uh, charge density, to the susceptibility of the charge density. And the second one, which is more important, it's proportional to the spin-spin interaction. So basically the sign of this uh, term depends on the particular sign of the spins involved here and the uh, sign of the uh, spin uh, susceptibility. So if you take this problem using um, uh, um, quantum electrodynamics, etc., and you solve it, you consider a, a um, I'll say to afromagnetic interaction between spin up, spin down uh, electrons. This becomes negative, and basically uh, the spin susceptibility remains positive at the origin and decays over space. That makes I'm sorry. That makes the potential induced uh, positive if the system is uh, at the border of Fermi magnetism. So in other words. In a spin triplet configuration, uh, there is always uh, certain regions of attractions between electrons that can be uh, obtained in this way. In the case of um, antiferromagnetic uh, interaction, this is also a minus uh, sign, but it turns out that in this particular case, when the, uh, where the material is at border of antiferromagnetism, the spin susceptibility it's maximum and positive at the origin, but oscillates in a space with a, you know, more or less with the periodicity of the Latin lattice constant. And that creates as well regions of attraction for uh, two electrons in a, in a spin singlet. So in other words, uh, materials that uh, are close to uh, antiferromagnetism usually uh, follow this way to uh, couple electrons and form Cooper pairs in the border of Ferromagnetism, this uh, attractive coupling is also possible in a form of a spin triplet uh, configuration. Okay, so for these experiments, I will uh, today focus on 2D materials. We have used 2D materials for our experiments, single layers of naivon diselenite and single layers of uh, tantalum diselenite. <clears throat> the reason for that is that these two materials um, have a very similar uh, um, have a very similar band structure, the one I show you here. So basically in the single layer limit, these two materials only have one band involved in superconductivity. There is only one band that crosses the Fermi level. As you see here, uh, it has a D character band. So basically it comes from the uh, transition metal element. And as you see in the single layer limit, uh, as I mentioned before, this material in the presence of a uh, strong spin orbit coupling, um, you know, the, the, this band is uh, split it into spin up and spin uh, down uh, subbands uh, in this particular region. Okay, but the, 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 in this case, the modeling of these materials is uh, way simpler than any other uh, unconventional superconductor. Okay, something, let me say something about these uh, two materials. Um, um, they are very similar and actually both. Uh, undergo a three by three uh, challenge city wave order at low temperatures, different uh, transition temperatures. I think tonight, Nevin diselenite is 30 Kelvin, tantalum diselenite is around 90 Kelvin, but the periodicity is the same. And actually, the STM images, the, 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 the three by three deconstruction looks the same. When you go to a monolayer, this uh, super lattice, this uh, CDW order, remains intact in the in the single layer form in both uh, in both materials in terms of superconductivity uh, these two materials are also uh, conventional superconductors in bulk although with a, a quite different um, uh, critical temperature 7.2 kelvin in naive diselenite and extremely low in tantalum diselenite 0 0.15 kelvin okay there are no many uh, works uh, uh, on bulk tantalum diselenide due to this uh, small um, critical temperature. We know well that uh, at least for naive diselenide, this material in bulk uh, 
has uh, two different gaps. It's a, a multi-gap material. Here you can see the first one uh, with a width of uh, 0 0.7 milli electron volts and the larger one with 1.4 milli electron volts. Um, experimentally, this is nothing that we can tell in, in tantalum diselenide probably is uh, similar, uh, but nobody, uh, I think experimentally, it's not proved that it's also um, uh, um, a multiband uh, superconductor. Okay, so let me now uh, start with uh, our theoretical, I mean, our experimental results. Um, so this is our experimental setup in our lab. We have an MBE instrument, a molecular beam epitaxy instrument that you see here when it's working with it right now. Here is the place where we grow uh, our 2D materials on different substrates, for example, on graphite or, or graphene substrates. Uh, many different substrates and by the way we only use this material for or i'm sorry this mb uh, system for selenium based materials uh, in order to avoid cross contamination with uh, let's say sulfurs or tellurium based materials so we only uh, we only use uh, this uh, for for um, selenium based um, tmd materials so once we have grown this material, uh, we basically capped it with amorphous selenium and we transfer it through air, that's not a problem, into our uh, STM system, which operates at a base temperature of 300 millikelvin. We have the possibility to apply uh, 11 Tesla to, to it. And it's working in, in under ultra high vacuum conditions. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with MB epitaxy, basically, um, the way we proceed is basically to uh, deposit the, we use the, uh, the, the elements that we want to grow. For example, uh, let's say niobium disinanide, we start from the pure elements and we uh, evaporate it uh, against a, a heated uh, surface, for example, graphene, in order to grow one more layer, two more layers, whatever you want. We previously grow or clean our substrates with a heater facility that we have here. So everything grows in ultra high vacuum environments. In order to grow, in order to um, you know, monitor the growth of our material in real time, we have a read, uh, the fraction pattern that we follow uh, in, in, in situ and in real time. So we are able to distinguish where the TMD is growing and more or less to estimate what is um, its um, the, the coverage of the material. If it's one more layer, half a more layer, two more layers, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes in the process of the optimization of, of, of these, uh, of these uh, TMD materials, we normally take these uh, TMD materials either to AFM in order to look for, I mean, to, 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 to check the cleanliness or the morphology at the very larger scales. We also uh, have access to XPS or RPS, um, um, machines here in the department. So basically we follow a process of optimization. After which we take it to our STM. Um, here I show you a larger scale STM image of one of our uh, neighboring disanide uh, samples grown on bilayer graphene on silicon carbide. So here you can see, uh, this is an island of neighboring disanide. These are other domains in an upper uh, terrace. Uh, Typical domain of our superconductors is around two, three hundred nanometers, and uh, here on the left you can see a um, couple of atomically resolved uh, images. In this case of naive disinfectant, when you can distinguish uh, apart from the atomic registry, you can also see the uh, three by three uh, charging city wave super lattice. Here, this is the substrate, the typical SEM image of our substrate in, in graphene, showing the you know, the underneath reconstructions on the, of the silicon carbide. Okay, um, so in terms, of, in terms of the band structure, and this is something that um, some of us did in the past, um, this system is well characterized, and I've been dicing it, it's well characterized on graphene. It shows basically, or it, it was predicted that in the single layer form, the, the number of layers, uh, when you reduce the material from bulk to, um, to the single layer, the band structure should, should simplify from three bands across on the firm level down to one band. And this is something that we had the chance to, um, to, um, to, to, 
to demonstrate using uh, ARPES. In the past, here you can see the two pockets that crosses the Fermi level. Here's one, here's another one. And even we, we, we don't see them separate in space because uh, Naive and Dyslanet is rotationally, uh, um, rotationally um, disordered. So we lose in ARPES our, our uh, angular resolution. However, uh, still we can distinguish these two uh, electron pockets. Um, so, so at lower energies, we already have the selenium-based uh, bands that have an effect in the STS um, curve. In the S this is an XTS spectra. Uh, so these two peaks correspond to the selenium-based uh, bands. The effect of these pockets on the uh, electronic structure, at least in the STS, is not big because these pockets are really far from the gamma point. And the most prominent feature is this uh, peak, which is an empty state, uh, and that we uh, attribute to this uh, band that, it, that it's basically crossing the gamma point here at around uh, half a volt. Okay, <clears throat> so if we look now in more detail around the front level where, um, you know, usually there should be our um, hallmarks of uh, these um, many body uh, states, such as a uh, transit wave, for example, at, at two Kelvin, you can clearly distinguish the transit wave gap measured uh, at two Kelvin, the width of this, um, the width of this uh, pseudo gap, uh, gap is around four, Middle electron volts, which is in good agreement with the um, critical temperature that we found, which is 33 Kelvin. So nothing changes with respect to to bulk. There are other there are other uh, reports that uh, claim that uh, the critical temperature in the monolayer uh, range go up to um, 150 Kelvin, but this couldn't be in, in in good agreement with the size of the of the transit wave gap that we that we observe. So if we uh, cool down the temperature below two Kelvin. Um, now, uh, in principle, and according to our previous transport experiments, the superconductivity state should be uh, fully developed at uh, the base temperature at which we work. And actually, what we see is something uh, that reminds uh, of a, 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 you know, superconducting superconducting uh, system. And if we, uh, the, the blue, the light blue curve that you see here, it's the VCS uh, fitting of this, uh, of this curve. And actually it fits very well, uh, including the coherence peaks. But if you look more carefully uh, outside of the, of the gap, uh, this, uh, or the, the behavior of this, um, of, of the, the conductance outside the gap uh, does not fit the VCS uh, uh, model. And actually what we see instead are uh, prominent deep hump uh, features followed, uh, I mean, several of them in general symmetric with respect to the Fermi level and in general equidistant with respect to the main uh, coherence peak. Okay, so here I show you uh, four different uh, spectra, the ADV spectra taken in four different places with uh, likely four different um, for different uh, tip apexes where you can see that the presence of these uh, features is something uh, quite common. And so for example, uh, the, if, you, if you look at, at this one is uh, basically you have one, two, three, four, five. Here you have actually six of them. And something that you can uh, uh, see without the need of any uh, statistical analysis is that in general, they show up in pairs at for uh, empty states and fill states. And, um, and they are in general, quite equidistant in energy, not uh, totally, but uh, sometimes we don't see um, some of them. Sometimes they appear symmetric, sometimes uh, not. Here in this case, for example, there is just one in this, or just one that we can clearly distinguish. On this side, there is two, but uh, that's a feature that we see uh, very, very, very uh, common. So in order to put some numbers and learn something about it, uh, we did some statistical analysis of the peaks that we found in our curves. Or for this particular uh, statistical analysis, we have used 
I think, nearly uh, 3,000 curves in, in different places, in hundreds of uh, different places. And we find clearly uh, five clear uh, peaks, um, one, two, three, four, and five. The first one corresponds clearly to the coherence peak or the superconducting coherence peaks and yield a value of uh, half a millivolt. I'm, I'm so, yes, half a millivolt. And the other four uh, can be fitted in, in this way. And basically the result of the fit of this histogram leads to four values for what we call omega, uh, omega uh, values for these features. We count them from the average value uh, of the coherence peak. I will show you why. We, we don't usually count from here, but uh, from the value, for the particular value of the, of the curve uh, for the coherence uh, peak value. And from that point, uh, we have uh, omega one, a value of uh, 0.53 millielectron volts. Sigma two is 1.02, 1.62 for omega three, and actually this is omega four, uh, 2.2 uh, millielectron volts. And basically, so you can see that um, all of them are basically multiple of this uh, omega one. So we uh, speculate that all the uh, features that we see are just multiple of the main one, the first one, which is the fundamental mode. And the rest of them, we uh, believe are harmonics of the, of the same one. So, okay, but what are these features and why are there in the, in the quasi-particle uh, um, part outside the gap? What's the origin? Okay, so here I list some of the um, possibilities. So one, uh, Possibility would be that uh, they should be, they could be um, uh, coherent peaks because we have um, multiple gaps, but that's not realistic because uh, then we would have like more than four. I think actually we would have uh, four uh, four gaps, and that's not realistic in a superconductor. So I, I guess we can rule it out. It could be a feature of the band structure that uh, if you look at the, at the scale that we have, it's 1.5 mil electron volts. And you can believe me, there is, um, so I can go back for a second to the band structure. And we are talking about our energy window, which is here. And there is nothing that can explain uh, the emergence of uh, so many features within the narrow, um, uh, energy window. So the most likely explanation is that we are dealing with a uh, bosonic mode. That's, that's something quite common in, in, in superconductors. But the problem is that which one it could be because there are several types of uh, superconduct um, bosonic modes. And some of them are just uh, typical from conventional superconductors. The most typical ones are phononic modes, Higgs modes, or spin resonances. This one, as I will show you in a second, is uh, uh, intrinsically related to uh, the presence of uh, spin fluctuations, magnetism in this in, <clears throat> in in superconductors. So, yeah. So let me give you a word about the phononic modes. Here I show you our uh, particular results that we took in LED one 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 in order to um, learn a little bit more about the phononic modes. Um, here you can see the superconducting uh, gap measured at uh, three hundred millikelvin. And apart from the gap and the coherence peaks, you can you see you can see two uh, you know shoulder deep futures in both uh, sides here for empty states and for occupied states in a symmetric way. Here you can see a zoom of uh, these futures, which do not resemble the, the the deep hump features that we see in Iobin dyselenite, but um, you know, this could be uh, one possibility. So phonetic modes actually um, follow in general positions in the density of states, in the density of states of the, of the, um, of the uh, phonetic dispersion. Here I show you the phonetic dispersion for LED 111. And uh, this is multiplied by the um, Eliasberg, uh, uh, Eliasberg function. So it gives uh, in this, Range. I think this is uh, around 10 millielectron volts uh, translated into energy. 
And you can see there are two peaks in the phonon density multiplied by the Eliasberg uh, electron phonon strength, Eliasberg function. And there are two peaks, omega one and omega two, that correspond in energy with these two peaks. This is something that um, it has been the, the, the dispersion of the, um, the phonon dispersion in, in, in naive foundation and has been calculated. It does not show, unfortunately, I cannot show you the uh, decent calculation for naive and dicenonite. I, I, don't, I don't have it at hand, but in any case, you have to believe me that there are no features that can lead to peaks in, 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 in this uh, energy range. This is three mill electron volts, okay? And basically, uh, there are no features that can explain the features that we see in naive and dicenonite. So we can rule out, uh, in general, phonetic modes. More, uh, more candidate, more candidate uh, would be the amplitude modes, or also called or known as Ben? Hi, Miguel. Can you hear me? I think it dropped out for some time. I was just checking if it's my own internet or yours. Can you hear me? Miguel? Okay. Well, let's give the uh, speaker a couple of minutes to rejoin. Oh. You're back. Okay. I think your, your microphone is still muted. I think you only dropped out for about a minute or so. Oh. <laughs> um, to a different connection, and I hope it goes better. So, hello? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Um, did, did, did you miss this explanation or? Um, yeah, maybe reshare your slides. I think it was just half a minute or a minute, so you didn't drop out for, for too long. Okay, um, so I was saying that in conventional superconductors like LED 111, uh, there are about phononic features, as the ones that you see here, that oh. whose shape is different from those we see in, in naive and disenonite, but yet uh, had to be considered. <clears throat> and the origin of this uh, phononic modes in conventional superconductors is in general an increase of the uh, phononic uh, density. Uh, Miguel, uh, what is just, at, at what? least I can see your slides. I'm not sure if anyone else can. Can you just... Can you see them? Uh, so I can you hear me. Maybe... Uh, Hola, hey. Yeah, maybe, maybe just try and reshare them. Uh, it, can you can you hear me now? I can hear you, but I can only see your face. I cannot see your slide, so you may have. Ah, to I was, I'm sorry because I was not sharing the screen. Uh huh. So, but you were at the right point. So we, I think we missed you right at the Higgs modes. Yeah. So exactly on this slide. Ah, so if you right. can recap what you, what you said about these slides. Okay. So basically, I was saying that we can rule out the phonetic modes because they are not there in the phonon. Um, Dispersion. Yeah, so I was saying that a more serious candidate would be the uh, amplitude modes or called also Higgs modes, which are fluctuations of the order uh, parameter amplitude. This is the free energy of the system of a superconductor that when it becomes superconducting, the symmetry uh, breaks. And basically, the order parameter acquires a very defined value, but uh, this is uh, just true. Uh, if we take into account uh, fluctuations that may happen, and usually the, the, um, the way they uh, can be seen is due to uh, interaction with uh, quasi particles. However, in superconductivity, or these modes are uh, dark modes, meaning that cannot be uh, observed. Uh, they are not, um, they cannot be, they are not visible. And uh, the only way to see them is uh, through the coupling with another electronic state different from superconductivity. 
Uh, one thing is that these the energies at which uh, the, the binding energies of these modes would be uh, quite similar to those where we have where we have seen our our um, our features. But and actually, let me tell you that this is something that it has been only seen, I think, to the best of my knowledge, in niobium diselenide in bulk. And the reason is because the system becomes superconducting, but also is coexisting with a transit wave mode, and that allows to uh, this dark mode to emerge and become uh, visible. <clears throat> this, as you can see, this energy is around one point something electron volt, so kind of could be um, uh, compatible what we see. The problem is that uh, we see nothing in bulk, in bulk where this material or, or where these Higgs modes show up so clearly in Raman. This is these are Raman, um, these are Raman um, optical. Um, uh, measurements in, in 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 STM they are they are not seen at all in the in the quasi particle um, density of states, so we don't believe we see it in in, in monolayer. Actually, there should be no reason why uh, there would be replicas of this mode. We see actually four different modes. Uh, we see we do see harmonics, and the last reason why we don't believe these are uh, amplitude modes is because they should be uh, non-sensitive to the magnetic field. And as I will show you in a second, they are um, these, these uh, features that we see are sensitive to the magnetic field. OK, um, so the last, um, the last possibility uh, would be uh, the existence of a spin excitation that it's intimately related to the, to the, to the existence of um, magnetism. These are collective excitations and they are uh, totally linked to the superconducting state, meaning that when they are in the superconducting state, they should show up. And when the superconducting state um, is uh, killed, they should be killed with the superconducting state. In general, in previous uh, STM measurements, they have been shown as uh, deep hump shape features like the one you see here for this heavy fermion compound, also for cuprates on iron-based superconductors. And the energies are, or the, the energies at which these uh, features are located, is well, are very well defined here. And it's well below two delta, which is okay, but I will show you in a second. It's not just below two delta, but at, at very uh, well defined energies. <clears throat> so there is a, 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 a work that uh, attempt to create a link between these magnetic resonances and uh, uh, the existence of the superconducting gap and the strength of the superconducting gap. And these guys uh, discover that there is a well-defined, uh, a universal relationship between this omega or this uh, uh, magnetic resonance energy modes and the uh, absolute gap and the magnitude of the gap. And that universal relationship follows this uh, ratio, it's 0 0.64. Uh, and actually, they also um, think that um, basically the energy, the, the binding energy of these collective modes uh, divided by uh, the thermal energy should follow a ratio of around five, six. So if we uh, look at our case and we consider the, the, the fundamental mode at 0. 53 million electron volts, basically um, our nibium diselenite lies here. But more importantly, if we look at the universal relationship, uh, the ratio in our case would be uh, 0 0.66. Um, and actually, uh, it lies here. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is just an indication that this could be um, uh, spin excitation modes in our uh, material. So the first thing we did was to study their uh, um, evolution with the temperature, because if they are related to superconductivity, they should be there in superconductivity and, of, of, of course, disappear with it. So here I show you the evolution with the uh, superconductivity. Um, here we increase the critical, uh, I'm sorry, we increase the temperature of the, of the sample, and we start uh, having uh, three different modes two on this side and one of this side. And as you can see, as, as we increase the, the, the temperature of the systems, the, the, the features, these STS features uh, fade out, fade away uh, from the systems. And at 1.4 uh, Kelvin, they are, totally, they are totally gone. The critical temperature of this material is around two Kelvin. So they're totally gone 
still within the, um, the, the superconducting state. So here I show you the evolution of this peak. So we fitted this, um, this particular, I'm sorry, we fitted this particular fit in order to account for the normalized amplitude starting here, this is 0 0.4 um, Kelvin, and this is the evolution of the, of the, of the peak. Okay, so in principle, uh, we we believe that this evolution within the the, the the critical temperature is here. So, as I said, they totally they are totally gone within the uh, the critical temperature or below uh, TC. But the, but we have to rule out the possibility that these STS features are uh, broadened by just thermal fluctuations. So here I show you the expected. Um, the expected evolution of the amplitude with the thermal evolution. So it started here. So if this broadening was just due to thermal effects, uh, the evolution could be similar, but only halfway, because at some point uh, the thermal broadening uh, could allow to see these features even above the critical temperature. And that's why, that's why <clears throat> we, we know that this decay is due to the weakness or the weakening of the superconducting states. And <clears throat> we can conclude that these modes are intrinsically related to the pairing interaction or superconductivity. <clears throat> so we also studied the evolution of these uh, peaks, of these features with a magnetic field. The critical feature, of the, I'm sorry, the critical field of these materials is around 2.2 uh, Tesla or so. So here I show you a set of data where you can see in this case uh, the, three first, the, the three first modes for empty states and two modes for um, uh, occupied states and their evolution with the, in, with the magnetic field. So as you can see, um, also these modes fade out uh, within the mixed state. So before the critical field or the second critical field, these modes are totally gone or disappear. But there is something really interesting is that these peaks are not constant with the critical field, but also move here. So here I show you uh, this line and this line that you see that they open with the increasing magnetic uh, state. And actually, this is the evolution of these peaks with the magnetic field. <clears throat> we know um, they uh, increase in a nonlinear fashion. We don't know why uh, actually it's nonlinear. Uh, that's something that probably theory will have to provide in the future, but uh, we do not. We, we know that in general, this is um, a good indication that the uh, spin fluctuations in our system have to be ferromagnetic because uh, the application of uh, ferromagnetic up up or the application of the magnetic state to an up up Cooper pair uh, basically increases the spin uh, resonance. Um, so one interesting thing about the position of, of this uh, fundamental mode with the magnetic field is that uh, the energy of this uh, fundamental mode against the um, against the, the, the gap follows an inversion uh, relation. It follows an anticorrelation between the fundamental mode and the size of the gap. So in, in this direction, the gap decreases, okay, and and so does the, um, the, the, the omega, I'm sorry, in, 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 and vice versa. So as the um, magnetic, uh, as the superconducting gap decreases, the omega or the spin excitation energy, binding energy increases. So it follows an anticorrelation. This is something that uh, has been uh, observed before in other uh, superconductors. So here I show you previous measurements of the uh, fundamental mode against the, uh, the superconducting gap mode for uh, four different materials. Uh, these are cuprate, cuprates, for example. In all of them, they show an inversion uh, relationship as the similar to one uh, that we observe here. They, all, all, of the, all of the plots are in general divided into two delta. And the reason is because uh, within the uh, theoretical framework, this is, should not only be uh, show a correlation, but it, all these values should be below two delta, meaning that the binding energy of this collective mode has to be lower than the uh, Cooper, uh, Cooper pair. 
Okay, and as you can see in all these uh, examples, uh, this ratio is below uh, one in our case as well in general, but uh, all these works um, um, uh, show this anticorrelation with uh, oscillation or fluctuations of the uh, superconducting uh, order parameter in a space. So oscillations due to, for example, the presence of um, uh, defects or other or, or charge patterns, et cetera, intrinsically present in the superconductor. So we had to do the same in order to make sure that this anticorrelation it's it's real and it in it and it's not just followed in the in the magnetic field. And so this is what we did. And here is the plot for the three first um, um, uh, uh, for the first three uh, modes that we observe. Uh, we have taken all of the uh, curves that I show you for the. Um, for the first uh, histogram that I show you, we have um, studied the position of the of the mode for the fundamental mode, or for the two first two uh, um, harmonics, normalized against um, normalized to two delta and uh, plot against the value at this particular point, at that particular point for each curve. And as you can see, uh, in, in all of the cases, they follow an anticorrelation. So basically, I think we believe this is a, a strong indication that the peaks that we see are spin excitations as well in analogy to the most known um, unconventional superconductors. And actually, if we plot the the, the, the value of the fundamental mode of the intrinsic mode measured previously against um, the two times the superconducting gap, they all follow this universal relationship below uh, this line, borderline, then we can locate the case of single layer naive dicyanide right here. So it seems that uh, we, we strongly believe that these um, collective modes are a spin excitation modes that originate from the vicinity of uh, magnetism or spin fluctuations in, in this particular material. So we have, uh, do we have a couple of minutes, Ben, or three minutes? Um, yeah, I mean, it's close to five, but it's interesting. So please keep, just keep going. Okay. I'm gonna <clears throat> make it longer than 10. Okay, so we have done this in order to rule out the, uh, uh, the presence of this material. I mean, in order to rule out the, the, the existence of these peaks, um, uh, I'm sorry, in order to rule out the, uh, the role of the substrate uh, in, in the presence of these peaks, we have studied naive single layers of naive dicyanide on a different substrate, not uh, bilayer graphene on silicon carbide, but monolayers of HBN on iridium. So in principle, the, the electronic gap of HBN is six electron volts. So uh, electronic, the, the 2D superconductor is in principle uh, fully decoupled. From, from the iridium. So this is the most isolated ideal thing, way we can work here. So in this limit, the chance to wave um, is conserved as well. Here I show you atomically resolved image. And the, the, the electronic structure is quite similar to the case of bilayer graphene. Here I show you um, the electronic structure in both cases. It's quite, quite similar. There are no uh, significant differences. So however, and Basically, if we go here at the Fermi level, we still see these uh, features on both, um, on both sides. So uh, the spin excitations are still there in, in, this particular, in this particular system. The only difference is that in this case, we are unable to reach a uh, zero value for the conductance in, in, inside the superconducting gap. And we believe the reason for that is that we have two channels in the channeling current, one of them <clears throat> to uh, naive dicyanide, and we are close enough to the iridium so that we tunnel. So, and we, we, we believe this conductance comes directly to tunneling to the, to the substrate. But other than that, the system behaves uh, in a similar way. So we have also done this experiment. We have tried to reproduce, uh, we, want, we are interested in, in how, how general this is in TMDs, right? Is, is it just something that uh, intrinsic to naive dicyanide, or is it something that can be found in other systems? So, so far we have also uh, done it on uh, single layers of tantalum dicyanide, on bilayer graphene. In this system, <clears throat> it's very common to find two different phases. The 1T phase, which is a mod insulator, 
this is the this is the gap. This is something that uh, Mike Cromie studied recently. And uh, if you focus on the H phase, which is similar to that, in in a Venn scenario, you can see the uh, three by three superlative, the challenge to wave. Nothing changes. The electronic structure in the larger scale is quite similar. And oops. And if you look at the uh, of the superconducting gap, you can still see it uh, surrounded in general by uh, by the spin excitations. Anyway, I have to admit that looking at our, 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 uh, the visualization of these peaks in general is much harder, much harder than in in the Dyson net. And one of the reasons is because the critical temperature in this material is much lower. Than, than in in Ivan Dyson and much much lower is probably 1.3 instead of two, which is not a big deal. I mean, it's not a big difference, uh, except if you are considering that we are working at uh, 300 millikelvin. So uh, that difference makes a, a big difference for us, and that's why the conductance in the superconducting gap doesn't go to zero here, and we are in a situation where uh, uh, seeing these features is quite. Uh, or it's tougher than in in the Iodine diselenide. In any case, uh, something interesting about the tantalum diselenide, apart from the existence of these uh, um, spin excitations, is that <clears throat> uh, I forgot to label this, but this is 0 0.4 and this is uh, 1.4. So basically, the superconductivity disappears at uh, at uh, 1.4 uh, Kelvin. But anyway, uh, so if you remember, uh, I said before that the critical temperature of this material in bulk is uh, 0 0.1 uh, Kelvin. So with respect to the bulk situation, um, the critical temperature or the, the, the superconductivity strength is, um, is increased in, in the monolayer limit. And this is in contrast to the naive dyselenide case where it goes down. Um, we don't know why, uh, nobody knows why yet. There is a lot of room for investigation in this regards. Nobody has studied naive disulfide. Uh, we're trying to do it soon, um, but I mean, it should be nice. It could be nice to to understand why uh, this is not behaving behaving in an universal way in TMDs, and each material behaves differently. It'd be nice. So with this, I just um, reached the conclusions to, to wrap wrap up. Uh, let me just. Uh, Say that uh, epitaxial growth in this we, we've been achieved the epitaxial growth of these materials uh, to to the superconductors, naive dyselenide and tantalum dyselenide. We have proved the existence of like, spin excitations in the quasiparticle density of states. We have proved that these uh, features are intrinsic to the superconducting state in this material, and, in, and not just in naive dyselenide but other uh, T and another TMD material. And basically, the message to take home is that it's a split fluctuations, and in general, the presence of magnetism must play a central role in the superconducting state on, on 2D materials. Uh, the question, the open question yet is how, right? So I left here some open questions. For example, something to be investigated would be uh, the symmetries of the Cooper pairs on why the spin fluctuations affect for example, the singlet component or the tiplet component, that's a, something that we cannot tell unless a calculation is done. We would like to know the role of spin fluctuation on each component. And something that should be uh, definitely investigated uh, further is the nature and the properties of this magnetic order. If it's um, the, super, the, the magnetism is uh, uh, developed at some kind or it just fluctuating without any long range order. And uh, to finish, let me just give you some uh, flavor about the future uh, measurements that we are planning to do. So we would like to uh, repeat this experiment in single layers of naive disulfide, which is a system that in general has no uh, transit wave. So in principle, we could be able to uh, rule out uh, the Higgs modes because we don't have the transit wave that could be coupled that could be coupling. Uh, we could like to uh, study uh, the presence of magnetic order in these uh, TD materials by putting some selected, uh, selected uh, non-magnetic uh, non uh, impurities in the system and see how the scattering um, uh, behaves in, 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 in this case. 
<clears throat> we would like to study something that we recently uh, became aware and we don't fully understand, which is the V shape uh, 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 in the in the density of states well above the um, well above the um, critical temperature. So that in this, when the system is not superconducting, we still see these uh, deep features that make us believe that probably uh, these are uh, pseudo gaps, which could be in line with uh, you know unconventional properties of this material. And finally, we are also working on the uh, you know trying to grow um, TMD materials using MBE, but on on devices in order to make uh, in, in order to be able to study this all these superconducting properties not just with STM but also uh, with uh, transport experiments. And that's kind of the things that we will do in the future. And that's it from my side. So. Band, um, if you have questions, comments, crit critics, whatever you want. Yeah, thanks, Just Miguel. Uh, that was a very, very nice talk um, and fascinating, fascinating topic. Um, yeah, maybe I'll open the session to everybody first to, to ask questions. So if you have a question, either unmute your microphone and ask, or you can also uh, send a question to the chat, uh, the chat window. Okay, if not, then uh, maybe I'll make a start. So I was wondering if uh, if you see any any spatial fluctuations in your in your bosonic modes. So, for example, if you look at the uh, the monolayer uh, topo topographic data, uh, so the, the charge density wave order is not perfect. Uh, it, it seems to have some some modulation and some disorder, right? So, if you if you track those bosonic modes, do you see any correlation, for example, with the uh, uh, the charge density wave order, or or is there no correlation at all? Yeah, of course, of course, of course uh, we did that experiment and the oscillations of the superconducting gap and the dysbosonic modes do not follow uh, the, the transit wave. Um, they don't follow the um, any presence. Well, sometimes we see something that could be, uh, um, so in, in, in some huge regions where we see, um, uh, let's say a deep in the superconducting, um, gap, for example, or increase in the superconducting gap, it's also obvious that the, the, this, phonic, the, this uh, spin excitation also changes accordingly. But in general, uh, we haven't found any um, registry uh, that we can identify. Um, so we believe that this, um, these oscillations occur probably near to the atomic registry and not on the nanometer scale or 10 nanometers. And so all the maps that we have kind of follow, uh, kind of show a tendency to be anticorrelated, but it's only when you mix on them together so where you realize that it's anticorrelated. If you look at a particular map, you can see, um, let's say, curve by curve that it's anticorrelated, but you don't find any pattern. That's what I mean. I see. Any particular pattern. Not definitely uh, following the chance to wait at all. Okay, interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do we do we have more questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. If uh, can anyone hear me? Uh, yes. Very yeah. good. Uh, so uh, thank you for thank you to the speaker for a, a marvelous talk. Uh, could you show the uh, spectral data where you were looking at the uh, temperature and field dependence? of the spectra, please. Mm -hmm. uh, field or? That uh, field, field here, this, this is great. This is great. Uh, so uh, in the field dependence here, you show that uh, the uh, first harmonic of the mode appears to have some nonlinear dependence on the field. Uh, you mean this? Yep, exactly. But if I look at the higher harmonics, it doesn't seem to be changing. Um, yes, they, they do. This, for example, this this one. But the uh, if you look at the orange one on the left, for example, the gap between the orange and the yellow at one point six Tesla is clearly much much smaller than at zero field. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's not, let's say, going towards uh, larger energies. So it's true that they are not um, scaling in the same way. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so the only common characteristic between all the modes is that they are 
let's say, separating from the um, Fermi level. So the, the binding energy is growing, but it's true that they are not parallel is what, I guess what you mean, right? Yeah, because I mean, if it's a harmonic, then it should also uh, in increase. Yeah, so I cannot answer that question because we don't even know why it's not uh, behaving uh, linearly. Okay. So um, I think pa our collaborator Paco Guinea is trying to um, find that out and we cannot tell that, um, we, we don't have an answer to that okay. right now. I have a, a, another question, if, if I may. Uh, Bento, have I got time? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So you, obviously, uh, one of the, uh, one plausible explanation for your data, as you say, is uh, spin fluctuations uh, causing some kind of unconventional pairing. But in this case, if it's unconventional pairing, similar to uh, all the other uh, types of uh, unconventional superconductor that you went through at the beginning, you would expect disorder to have a, a strongly suppressive effect on superconductivity. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. Yeah, but don't uh, you and uh, some other groups as well, as well have uh, data showing that uh, disorder can enhance superconductivity in monolayers of niobium diselenide? Mm -hmm. yeah, Multifractal enhancement. Yeah. How is that compatible with uh, spin uh, singlet triplet mixing uh, because uh, the multifractal enhancement is only valid for uh, traditional S wave superconductivity. Well, yeah, the the, the multifractal um, behavior is something that can be seen even at lower temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, that's something quite clear here in the in the intensity and fluctuations in the in the and the, um, in the coherence peaks. Yep. Okay, and that clearly mm -hmm. it's a uh, hallmark of, uh, but um, I have to say that these samples are quite crystalline and the amount of disorder is really, really small. And we barely see uh, defects. And I, I, I guess actually that our more, the most important source of defects in, in our samples are the edges, in fact. Okay. Uh, that is probably enough to trigger um, the multifractality, which uh -huh. I believe um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the, its effect can be seen in the coherence peaks, but uh, probably it's not enough to modify the existence of these this peaks. That's why we want to add some, some, um, some defects to the, to the lattice uh, in order to be able to study how they behave in the presence of defects. Okay. I, I, I was expecting that uh, if you had spin fluctuation mediated uh, pairing, then uh, disorder would kill it rapidly. The disorder would kill the spin fluctuations? It, it, would, it would kill the pairing mediate, or rather the gap, if it was mediated purely by spin fluctuations. Well, but the spin fluctuations can, I mean, can be either destroy Cooper pairing or not. Sh sure, but uh, if, you if you have a uh, superconducting gap, that's mediated by uh, spin fluctuations. And in general, in general, you would expect to have a more complex gap distribution as a function of momentum, in which case disorder would suppress your superconductivity much more strongly. Well, I, I guess you are suggesting that we could, um, that we could link these um, um, spin excitations um, behavior in real space with fluctuations of the multifractal behavior, is what you're saying. And th that's one, uh, yeah, one that's direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's something that we haven't done, but that's, like that's that an interesting Maybe discussion. for the sake of time, you can, can keep that discussion offline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a very exciting question, or a very interesting question. And I guess the effects of disorder, um, yeah, that's probably something that. that uh, oh, yeah, that's that, something that we haven't done, but it, it'd be right. nice to see the multifractality and these spin excitations are, are correlated somehow. That's, I guess, yeah. Uh, I had one question, quick question regarding this anti-correlation of the, uh, the gap and the uh, fundamental mode that you showed, which uh, seemed to be a smoking gun signal of, uh, of bosonic modes. Uh, so that's very exciting. The, the only question I had was, uh, is, that, is that unique to spin excitations or is it essentially a, a sign of any bosonic excitation, uh, any, uh, yeah, any bosonic mode? Uh, um, no, as far as I know, is 
just something that distinguishes uh, spin excited tensions for other bosonic modes. And actually, uh, for example, uh, phononic mode is also a bosonic mode. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't show any uh, correlation to the best of my knowledge. And the Higgs okay. mode, the problem is that I don't know uh, what, uh, how it should be about the, 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 the you know, the Higgs modes, but uh, you know, the amount of works and theory in the literature, um, I, I couldn't find it. So I have no idea how they should behave. I just found that there should be no uh, replicas. That's all I know. Um, whether they would be anti-correlated with the superconducting gap or not, Probably, probably not, because actually they are linked to the ch chance to wave mode, not to the superconducting mode. But, um, and probably not even, per because these are fluctuations of the superconducting order parameter. So I guess they, if I, if I had to guess, um, so if the superconducting order parameter is much smaller, I don't see why this uh, mode would be, would have a, Larger binding energy, right? I, I would expect a, a, you know, a proportional, um, a, a linear proportional, so, and not and not an anti-correlation, but anti a, a correlation simply. That's okay. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, do we have do we have more questions from the audience? Um, so I guess I guess we are well over time. <laughs> so yeah, it was very very exciting, and thanks for going into so much detail. That was really really interesting uh, to see all this uh, this new physics. Uh, yeah, so thanks for a great talk again, and Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, let's catch up offline also. Okay. For okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you for listening.